last lecture, we've learned a set of properties for systems. We have these six properties. Uh, the first two properties, memory list and causal, depend on the time index. Uh, for example, if output yt only depends on input xt at the same time t, then the system is memory list. It only depends on x tau for all the time tau before time t, then it is causal. Those properties hold for both continuous time and discrete time systems, and the concepts between these two category systems are not really very different. Most of the time, just a change of time index from t to n. For the third property, uh, the invertibility of a system, it really depends on whether we can find a inverse function between the input signal x and the output signal y. So I'm referring to the function relationship between x and y. I'm not referring to the function relationship between x and t or y and t. And also this inverse function does not have to be uh, xt as a function yt. It can also be xn as function of y at uh, not only time n, but also some other times. So it's a function relationship between the entire uh, signal x over time and the entire signal y over time. So that's one remark that I forgot to put in the last lecture. For the next property, stability, the key is to justify that for any bounded input, we can find uh, the, the output is bounded. Uh, the boundedness of a signal is that is defined as we can find a constant that bounds x t for all the time t, even if x, uh, even if t goes to infinity. So to understand this property stability, we really want to we really need to understand the uh, concept of boundedness of a signal. Therefore, to prove that a system is bounded, we need to prove that for every bounded input, the output is bounded. But to justify that the system is instable or not stable, thanks. we only, what, all we need is to find a counterexample. And a common counterexample that we use is a constant input, because a constant input is already, always bounded. Therefore, if we can show the output for this particular input is unbounded, then the system fails to be stable or it is instable. For time invariance, uh, the uh, intuition is that when we shift the input signal for a certain amount, the output must also shift by the same amount. Again, to prove time invariance, we need to show that this definition holds for all the input signals. But to show that the system is time varying, in other words, not time invariant, then we only need to find a counterexample. A common counterexample is the unit in power signal. So if you can show for, a, for the input to be unit in power, the output something, but if we change the input to a time shifted version of unit in power, the output is not the same time shifted version of the original output, then that system is time varying. And the last property which we haven't finished is linearity. And uh, we, so last lecture we did these two examples. Let's pick up from where we stopped. So the third example is yt equal dx dt. Again, uh, to use the definition of linearity, we just assume there are two inputs which produce their respective output that are dx dt, and a new input is linear combination of x1, x2. We see if the output is the same linear combination. So output y3 of t, dx3 of t dt, just by this relationship that's given, x3 is ax1 plus bx2, so just write it here. And this derivative operation is subject to the distributive uh, property. So which means we can split it, we can pull 
pull the linear coefficients a and b in front of the differentiation. And dx1 dt is y1, dx2 dt is y2. So we can see that the new output is the linear combination with the same coefficients of the original outputs. Therefore, it satisfies the definition for linearity. The next two examples, uh, actually the next example, y equals 2x plus 3, is uh, interesting. That's because if you look at the right-hand side, this 2x is a linear term. And actually, 2x plus 3, we call it a final function of x. Intuitively, such kind of uh, input-output relationship should give us a linear system. But it turns out that the system is nonlinear, which is quite uh, not quite intuitive. So similarly, as the uh, time invariance and the stability properties, we can also it is also adequate for us to find a counterexample to show a system is nonlinear. Uh, here, the counterexample is this particular linear combination x3 equals x1 plus x2. So we, for the counterexample, we no longer need uh, general linear coefficients a and b. Just use a equals 1, b equals 1, a particular example. So for input x1, output y1 is here. Input x2, output y2 is here. It just follows this relationship. But for the new input x3, we see, let's see what is uh, y3. Again, it is 2x3 plus 3. x3 is x1 plus x2 by this construction of new input. So ideally, we want to have y1, which is 2x1 plus 3, y2, which is 2x2 plus 3. But from this step to this step, we have two we have twice plus three. Therefore, we need to have an additional minor three to make this equality hold. So this is actually y1 plus y2 minus three, which is not y1 plus y2. In other words, if we construct an input signal, which is this particular linear combination of the original inputs, the output fails to be the same linear combination of the original outputs. Therefore, it violates the definition of linearity. That's a nonlinear system. For the next one, yn equals x1 minus 4n. So this is a uh, time scaled version and reflect version of x. For this kind of operation, what we can find is that in general, the system is linear. That, that can also be uh, verified through the definition. Right, y1, y2, just x1, y minus 4n, x2, y minus 4n, constructing a new input x3, which is ax1 plus bx2, y3, just uh, ax1 plus bx2 with the time index change to time index change to 1 minus 4n. The first and second term correspond to ay1, by2 respectively, so it is exactly. Uh, what the definition requires a linear system to be. Okay. And the last example, we have a discussion of different cases depending on the time index, right? Whether the time index is positive, zero, or negative, we have different outputs. For this kind of system, uh, Given particular inputs, the output also follow the same relationship subject to discussion of time index. So we just copy it here. Nothing changes, but only the, uh, the subscripts uh, indicating particular inputs. Again, by definition, we construct a new input, which is a linear combination of the original two inputs. To look at the output, we also need the same time discussion the time index discussion, right? And positive and zero and less than zero. For example, when it's positive, what is y3 of n? Just look up this table. y3 of n should be x3 of n plus one because we are looking at n positive. And x3 n plus one, by this construction, it's ax1 bx2, but need to use the same time index. Now, time, now the time index is n plus one. 
x1 n plus 1 looking up this table it corresponds to the y1 and similarly x2 n plus 1 corresponds to y y2 so this linear combination with the same coefficients for the original outputs y1 and y2 and this holds for n equals 0 and n less than 0 so in particular for n equal to 0 y3 of n equal to 0 Without a loss of generality, we can write it as a0 plus b0. And the two zeros correspond to the input of the, or the, the original inputs when n equal to 0. So that can also be written as y1 n plus y2. So overall, it satisfies the definition for linearity. So, as we can see, the linearity uh, property is not uh, something very hard to tell. And uh, most of the time, we can find the system is, is linear. Right? Okay. Now we've uh, finished learning the technical part of chapter one, basic signal system. Let me give uh, you an summary so that we can move on to the next chapter. So in this chapter from the first lecture, we learned what is a signal. A signal is a function of independent variable. So during the first uh, part of this term, the independent variable refers to time, either continuous time t or discrete time n. But later the independent variable can be frequency after we learn uh, Fourier transform and Laplace transform. So we learned some transformation of signals over the independent variable, over the time. The three types of transformation, time shift, scaling, and reflection. Uh, reflection also called the time reversal or mirroring. Basic properties of signals. So what is an even signal? What is an odd signal? Periodic signal, how to tell whether signal is periodic. Uh, how to find the fundamental period of signal. So there is a difference between continuous time signal and uh, discrete time signal. In general, for a discrete time signal to be periodic, there are more uh, restrictive conditions that one needs to satisfy. And then we introduced a important mathematical concept, complex number, uh, from which we, uh, we, can, uh, we learned a a type of fundamental signals, a complex exponential signals, and also a unit step, unit impulse, which are very basic in our signal operations. Then we learn what is a system. A system is a process that converts an input signal to an output signal. Uh, we have continuous time system, discrete time system. We have different connection or configurations of systems, like systems in series, in parallel, feedback system. We have uh, six words to describe uh, characteristics or properties of systems, memories, causal, invertible, stable, time environment, and linear. So that's all what we learned in chapter one. Now let's come to a new chapter, which focuses on the last properties that we learned about systems, time invariance and linearity. So it's a linear time invariance systems. Now let me switch to the next set of slides. The linear time invariant systems, the recommended reading is the textbook chapter two. So you are always uh, suggested to uh, look at the example problems and the exercises uh, in the textbook to, to get yourself more familiar with those concepts. That will also benefit the, uh, your, your tests uh, and uh, exams. Okay. Outline of this chapter, first we will give an overview of the linear time invariant systems. So we always call these kind of systems LTI for abbreviation. And associated with LTI system, we will learn uh, two important concepts. One is called convolution, which is actually a kind of uh, mathematical operation that is very common in the subject of signals and systems and later in your information theory and uh, communications curriculum. 
uh, and also unit impulse response. So we've learned what is a unit impulse in chapter one. And this chapter, we will learn a new concept called unit impulse response. And there are also some properties associated with LTI systems that we will learn. First, what is linear time invariant LTI system? Uh, basically, it's a system that is both linear and time invariant. Here, I put the definition of linear and the invariant, time invariant properties just to recap. But for linearity, we just saw a lot of examples. So for arbitrary inputs, so note that for a system to be linear, this property must hold for arbitrary inputs x1, x2, and arbitrary coefficients a and b. And the linear combination of input leads to the same coefficient linear combination of outputs. That's called linearity. Time invariance for arbitrary input, we shift it by arbitrary amount uh, T0, then the output also shift by the same amount T0. Well, the concept does not look much different for discrete time system, just change T to N. And some examples of LTI systems, actually a lot of these examples, we've seen it in the last chapter. Uh, some very commonly seen example in engineering practice, for example, for continuous time, the time delay system, which means output T is the input two time steps ago, or the running integrator. So we take the integral up to the current time T. So basically integral, integrating over all the historic input X and differentiator dx dt. And for discrete time, we have counterparts. The time delay takes the same form. The running integral becomes running sum. So m is the index for the summation terms. So usually m ranges from minus infinity to the current time step n to get the current time step output yn. And the inverse operation of uh, this running sum is called the first difference or a differentiator xn minus xn minus one. The LTI systems have wide application in uh, real world. Uh, here I give you some uh, engineering fields, for example, circuits, especially integrated large scale circuits, uh, power grid, the electricity that we use daily flows in this uh, big system power, power grid, internet. So the relationship between the packet sending rate, the size of the uh, buffer at the clients and the round trip time, those relationships can be modeled as LTI systems. Uh, earthquake propagation. So if you consider the change of energy level at the source of the earthquake and the, uh, well, the force of uh, destruction at different locations over time. So this can also be described by a, a function uh, over time and over location can be modeled as LTI system. But in principle, most of these phenomena in time, they are actually ne neither linear nor time invariant. In practice, all these phenomena, or all these systems are more complicated than LTI systems. But LTI systems are still very useful because it is common for us, for scientists and engineers, to model these systems as LTI. It's a simplified version of, this, of these systems. Uh, the purpose is to just capture their very basic principles to so how things change. And only after understanding these basic principles, we can add more details to the model to, uh, to, to capture more about this phenomenon. Uh, for example, one thing we usually did for the complex nonlinear system is uh, linearization. So to convert a nonlinear system to a linear system. And the, mathematically, the common treatment for linearization is just to use the Taylor expansion of a function that you've learned in your calculus class. So Taylor expansion have the zeroth order term, the first order term, second order, third order, and so on. In the case that the value of function that we assess is at a point that's not far from the reference point for the linear expansion, for the Taylor expansion, then we can uh, safely discard the 
second order, third order, and higher order terms because as the orders become higher, those terms have smaller, smaller values that are negligible. We only return the zeroth order and first order terms and the resulting system is actually a linear system. Also for time invariance, so the parameters that characterize the input, the relationship between input and output of these systems are usually changing over time if we look at a relatively long time frame. But for the scope of problem that we study, we often focus on a limited time frame. And at the particular time scale that we are interested in, it is uh, a common practice to assume that those parameters or those input output relationships keep constant during the time frame that we study. Therefore, the system can be approximately modeled as time invariant system. That's how we model those practical complicated phenomena as LTI. Okay, now let's come back to uh, the math part associated with LTI systems. Uh, why we study LTI system with a dedicated chapter? So what is special about this kind of system? To understand what is special about LTI, let's first define a concept called unit impulse response. So we have LTI system, right? I put LTI here to emphasize that the property of the system. Given input x of n, it has some output y of n. Here, let, let's use discrete time system, for example, and later we will come to continuous time system. And the input x of n can be arbitrary. We just consider a particular input, which is the unit impulse delta n that we learned before. And corresponding to this delta n, there is an output signal we use a special notation for it. We call it H of n. This H of n is called unit impulse response because it is the response of the system to the unit impulse input. It is worth pointing out that for a given LTI system, so the system is already given here, then the unit impulse response H of n is a signal over n that is fixed and unique. And therefore, it is an inherent property of this LTI system itself. For a particular LTI system, there is a signal H of N, which is the unit impulse response. So why do we introduce this concept, unit impulse response? Because that facilitates us to play with the input to get some more uh, insight for behaviors of the, uh, of the LTI system. First, let's consider the time shifted version of the input. So the original input is unit impulse delta of n, and we change the input to delta n minus one, which means we shift the input, we shift the impulse to the right by one unit. Because of the time invariance property of the LTI system, the output h also shifts by the same amount to the same direction. So it also shift from H of N to H of N minus one. And similarly, if we shift input by two units, then the output becomes H of N minus two. We can also shift the input to the left, so it becomes delta N plus one. Correspondingly, output H becomes H N plus one. And similarly, input is delta N plus two, output is H N plus two. So this is just the result of playing with different input, different unit impulse input. And further, we can add all this input together with a linear coefficient uh, associated with each term. What I mean is for, for delta of n, we multiply it by a constant coefficient, a zero. For delta of n minus one, we multiply it by a one delta n minus two multiplied by a two. Similarly, for delta n plus one, n plus two, and so on, we have the coefficients a minus one, a minus two. And we consider infinite sum. So we can have delta n minus three, n minus four, and so on, until n minus very large positive integer. And delta n plus three, n plus four, and so on. So this is an infinite sum. This is a linear combination of time shifted versions 
of the unit impulse. So now we take this linear, linearly combined input to the system and see what is the output. And because our TI system is linear, and the definition of linearity is that if the input is a linear combination of some, in, some original inputs, then the output is the linear combination with the same coefficients of the corresponding original outputs. So the output has the same linear coefficients, a0, a1, a2, and so on, a minus one, a minus two, and so on. Uh, following each coefficient are the original output that correspond to the uh, input. So hn is the output corresponds to delta n, hn minus one is the output corresponds to delta n minus one, and so on. So this is the output. So why we make so much effort to get the behavior of this LTI for this kind of input, this kind of output? So, uh, well, to summarize, for any input that is a linear combination of shifted versions of unit impulse, the output is the same coefficient linear combination of shifted versions of unit impulse response. Right? Remember that this H is defined as the unit impulse response. But why we write it in this term? Why is this uh, result useful? That's because a matter of fact in uh, the field of signal system. Arbitrary input signal, we can find some way to express it as a linear combination of shifted versions of unit impulse. So this, this, we can express the input signal in this form for arbitrary input signal. Therefore, given any input signal to a particular LTI system, we can conveniently obtain its output, or in other words, the response of the LTI system. If we know the following two things, the first thing is, of course, the unit impulse response H of N, because we need H of N to write the output. Uh, actually, when we know H of N, we also know its time shifting versions, H N minus one, minus two, H N plus one, and plus two, and so on. And the second thing that we need to know is how to express this input in a way, in this way, how to express it as a linear combination of shifted versions of unit impulse. The unit impulse delta N and their shifted versions, we already know what they look like, that we can plot them. So to express input in the, as this linear combination, the key is to know the coefficients a0, a1, a2, a minus one, a minus two, and so on. For different input signal x of n, there are different linear coefficients a0, a1, a2, and so on. And it's our, our target to determine these coefficients so that we can express input signal as this linear combination. This motivates these two important concepts that we will learn for this chapter. Unit impulse response, which we already defined, and convolution. So basically, convolution, uh, basically the, the process of expressing input signal as a linear combination of unit impulses can be defined as the convolution of this input signal with the unit impulse signal. So we will see it in detail. So we will introduce convolution. Again, we use discrete time first as an example. We are given an arbitrary discrete time signal x of n. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. The, the coefficient should be related to how the signal looks. Yes. For different signals, there should be different uh, coefficients, and those coefficients are what we need to need to know or what we need to solve for. Okay. Now we are given arbitrary discrete time signal x of n. So how do we express x of n in terms of unit impulses? Let's decompose x of n as an infinite sum. Each term of this infinite sum corresponds to a particular value of x of n that's non-zero. 
for example, x of n for n equals time minus two, its value is here. We just move this single branch here and set every other i value to be zero. For time n equals minus one, it takes a negative value, which move, we copy the same negative value here and make everything else zero. Similarly for n equals zero, so the, it takes this value, which move this value here. For n equals one, the same operation. This is an infinite sum because we have infinite terms for all the time n. That's why I have plus sign for the bottom and for the bottom and top of the slides, which means this summation can extend to infinity. So after expressing the signal x of n as this infinite sum, what we need to do is to express each of these uh, summed signals mathematically. For example, for this signal, we focus on this. We write it in this way. So first, what is delta n plus two? It is the shift of unit impulse to the left by two units. The unit impulse is originally occurs at time zero and its value is one. After we shift it to time minus two, it occurs here and also because it is copied from the original signal x of n, in particular at n equals two, this value is x of minus two. That's why we need to multiply it by x of minus two because originally delta at the impulse has value one. So x of minus two times one gives us x of minus two. And similarly, this impulse that occurs at n equals minus one is x of minus one times delta n plus one. Same format for all the for all the impulses that occurs at other locations. Okay. And we can write this infinite sum in the compact form. Our observation is that if you first look at those axes, x minus two, minus one, zero, one, and it can go to minus infinity and can, can go to positive infinity. So we can express what's inside this square brackets with a time index k. And for this, and a further observation is that we have minus two here, we have plus two inside the brackets following delta. Uh, minus one, we have plus one. So they, they have different signs, they have opposite signs. That's why if we put k here, there must be minus k following the uh, brackets in the brackets following delta. And this is the infinite sum, which means k can be any integer down to negative infinity up to positive infinity. So this expression is exactly this infinite sum on the right hand side, but we just write it in a compact form. And this infinite sum that involves both signal x and the unit impulse delta and their shifted versions it's called the convolution. It's a convolution between the signal X and the signal delta of N. And we write it symbolically as Xn star delta of N, which also reads as X of N convoluting delta N. So this is this. So they are, they are equivalent. Now here we defined the convolution between arbitrary signal and unit impulse. And what we find is that we start from x of n, we can write it as infinite sum, which is defined as convolution with delta n. So one conclusion we have is that for any signal x of n, its convolution with the unit impulse signal delta of n leads to the signal itself, xn equals xn convoluting delta of n. Now let's come back to our LTI system because the purpose we introduce this mathematical tool convolution is to study LTI system. For the LTI system, what we've obtained so far is that if the input is this big linear combination, output is the same linear combination of unit impulse responses. And 
for this linear combination, the coefficients are ak. But actually, for an arbitrary input x of n, if we try to write it in the way of this linear combination, then the x of k is indeed the coefficient ak, which means a0 we can replace it with x of 0, a1 we can replace it with x of 1 huh, because of this infinite sum. And we know that this means it is the x of n converting delta of n, which is x of n itself. That's the input side. And the output side, we do the same replacement. A0 is replaced with x of 0. A1 is replaced with x of 1, and so on. This is also infinite sum. I'm write it in a compact way. This is x of k times h of n minus k for all the integer index k from negative infinity to positive infinity. Now, what is this? We've introduced this concept of convolution. So when this infinite sum is between x and delta, for this kind of organization of the time index, then it's x convoluting delta. If we change just the symbol delta to h, it is what we have on the output side of the signal. And that is x of n convoluting h of n. Again, let me emphasize that h of n is not an arbitrary function. It is the it is the unit impulse response of this LTI system, which is unique and fixed, which is an inherent property of this LTI system. Okay. And the takeaway for, the, for this chapter's lecture so far is just this one conclusion. Let H of n be the unit impulse response of an LTI system, then for an arbitrary input signal X of n, the output signal or the system response Yn is the convolution of x of n and h of n. And therefore, sometimes in the box representing the LTI system, we all always write h of n for two reasons. One reason is that h of n is an inherent property of the system itself. So it's a label of the system or it's an identity of the system. And the second, it is very straightforward to understand this process. So X of n going through a system whose unit impulse is H of n produces the output X of n star H of n, X of n convoluting H of n. So this is a common way that we represent an LTI system. Okay, so uh, we still have some time. Let's do an exercise. Uh, I will give you two minutes uh, to let you try this first. We have LTI system whose unit impulse response H of n is given on the left figure. And now, in principle, for any input signal X of n, we can determine its output using convolution. Now we are given a particular input. Let's calculate and plot the particular output Y of n corresponding to this input. Two minutes.
Yes, that's some of us. Some of you already posted a question in the chat window. That's the correct way to uh, tackle this problem. So let's go through it together. So the output y of n is the discrete time convolution between input x of n and the unit impulse response h of n. And definition of convolution is this infinite sum over time index k. And for this particular example, this infinite sum becomes a finite sum. Because if you look at x of k, it's zero everywhere, except for k equals zero and one. Therefore, it is okay for us to only return two terms in this summation, k equals zero and k equals one. So far, this uh, term inside the summation does not change, but we can write it more specifically, it's x zero, h of n minus zero, which is h of n itself x1 with h of n minus 1, which is time shifting version of hn. What, he, what are x0, x1? We can refer to the given input signal x0 equals 0.5, x1 equals 2. So we replace x0, x1 with 0.5 and, zero and 2 respectively. So this is a simplified result compared to the original infinite sum. And work, we can further look at h of n, h of n minus one, how they look like. Actually, let's plot 0.5 h of n, because h of n here is here. 0.5 h of n does a change the height from one to 0.5 everywhere and equals zero, one, two. h of n minus one is the time shifted version of h of n. So shifted to the right by one unit. That's why originally they are correct. The Impulse one occurs at time n equals zero one two. Now after the shift, it occurs at time n equals one two three. Don't forget this coefficient two. It means originally the height is one. Now the height is two. The result y n is just the summation of these two signals. So in particular, everywhere else we have zero, but for the four particular time indices zero one two three, we need to pay attention to their values. For n equals zero, we have 0 0.5 plus zero, which is 0 0.5. For n equals one and two, we have 0 0.5 plus two, which is 2.5. For n equals three, we have zero plus two, which is two. And this is the output yn, also the convolution of xn and h. Okay. So we have more examples associated with discrete time convolution, and we will introduce the extension to continuous time LTI system in the next lecture. Uh, so uh, please uh, stay for the tutorial uh, for this uh, that's delivered by the TA starting 10.30. Uh, I will see you in the next week. Thank you.